Hello again. We're now going to talk about phylogenetic networks. And I'll start with a little bit of a motivation as to why I go to these uh, objects first when I'm doing a phylogenetic analysis. I do that because they are a really great way to show how complex a data set is and that maybe what might be the internal branches of the true underlying phylogeny or the clades, if you like, that are going to be problematic to estimate correctly. Um, so the long branches are generally pretty easy to estimate and the, unless they're too long, but short branches can be really tricky. And a very good way to visualize the um, amount of good signal, good phylogenetic signal versus less good uh, or whether conflict is to look at a phylogenetic network like this. So I've loaded the alignment file into split tree four, and this is the first um, figure that I've got. You might be wondering, what is that big mess in the middle? We're definitely going to cover um, lots of details about what that is, where my cursor is going round and round. But to start with, you can see um, there are the taxon names around the outside. So this is an unrooted structure, similar to the circular tree layouts that we saw before. So somewhere in the middle here is our supposed common ancestor of this clay. There's a couple of um, nice ways to navigate uh, around this figure. It's difficult to see what's going on in the middle, but we can zoom in. So let's do that now. This is just a scroll key um, on the mouse. Let's zoom in as far as I can, and I hope you can see the details there. Zooming out, scroll key. And I can also pan around. Uh, just a click and drag on the mouse. And if I want, want to, I can rotate the thing as well. And it does a good job. It doesn't keep things perhaps in center. It does a good job laying out the the um, taxon labels as we go. I'm going to try and adopt a, con a consistent orientation for this particular network, for this particular data set with my two full name species over here on the right. Now let's investigate what's in these um, figures. So I've done a little bit of clicking and dragging. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see better what's going on. There's an indicator on the top left, which would be very hard for you to see on your screen right now, but there's a scale bar there, and that says 0.1 there, which is a measure of the branch lengths. So anything that long has a branch length of 0.1 on this figure. Now, the branch lengths correspond to phylogenetic models or evolutionary models. And I haven't said what model this one is yet, but I'm going to come to that once we understand what the what this mess really means. You might have noticed that there are long rectangles and short fat rectangles. And each of the long thin rectangles, I can actually zoom in on a bit more. That's using the scroll key. I just clicked on the this set of parallel lines here. This set of parallel lines corresponds to a split. That is a separation of these two taxa here, a Marconoi, Marconoi and a Strami versus everything else. That's not the only possible split that's supported by the data. In some splits, I don't know whether I can click on one. That's the same. Here's a different split. I've just zoomed right the way in and found a different split that is supported by the data in which A. Marconoi and A. Strami are not each other's closest relatives, but instead A. Strami is with this group over here. So there's a much lower support of, of that um, split of the taxa in the data, but it is there. And in a phylogenetic tree, we can only see a set of compatible such splits. We can only see a set of 
uh, relationships that will fit on one tree. And this is one of the big advantages of having a phylogenetic network. It actually shows you a lot more of the complex information that separates uh, species out, perhaps in different ways that can't fit on the same tree. So that's how we can understand a little bit about what a split is. There's another split down here. If I click on any of those parallel lines where my cursor is, it will highlight the set of taxa that are separated off from the others and the lines that correspond to that particular split. Let's look at another one. If I zoom out again, I'm going to follow one through a couple of different analyses and see if it changes uh, uh, or if it stays uh, nicely consistent. I'm going to click on this one here where I have a limifrons and a lineotopus, excuse pronunciation, which look like they're potentially a good play. They're sort of well supported, but you can see as well, there might be some indications in the data that would actually put limifrons with humulus, because if I look in closely here, there's also support for that split, if I can click on it there. So it looks like there might be some conflict and we're going to investigate what happens to that clade under different um, models. This brings me to the different models. So if I zoom out again, this is the default layout or the default um, distance measure that is used when you load up uh, an alignment in splits tree. And if you go out to the distances men menu, you can see that this is highlighted as the uncorrected P distance. Uncorrected P just means the proportion of sites that differ between any two sequences. So uncorrected means it's got no sense of um, a molecular model of any significance, uh, of any complexity. And it's just P for proportion. So it's a value between zero and one. If I come back to that scale bar I mentioned before, that scale bar of 0.1, that means that the distance between these two taxa, Diplolamus darwinii and Phenacosaurus acuperostris, is pretty high. That's 0 to 0 0.1. It looks about the same as this branch length here and this branch length there. So the distance between these two taxa is about 0.2. That's about 20% sequence divergence or sequence difference between the two. So that's quite a lot. And that's going to make you suspicious perhaps that inferring this phylogeny might be tricky. So I'm now going to change distance measure and we're going to go with our simplest of the um, substitution models. And that is the Duke's Cantor model. That's just one parameter. When I select that, dialog box pops up. I can do this and I can select other options as well at this point, but I'm not going to. And there are some other options as well I can check, but I'm not going to as well uh, just for this uh, tutorial. I'm simply going to go apply. And noting that it does rearrange things, I'm going to rotate that back to about what it was before. We can see that the scale bar is a little bit smaller, but if I zoom in, it will lengthen. And it looks like these distances are in fact actually a bit longer. And this is a reflection that um, there might have been some uh, changes of state from say an A to a C and then back to an A again that we would have missed using the p-distance, uncorrected p, but the Duke's Cantor method will account for. So these are expected to get a little bit longer under that, such a model. So we're interested in what's happened to that clade that we were, or that triple of sequences that we were interested in before. So a humulus, a limifrons, and a lineotopus. So if I click on that split, this is the amount of support, relative amount of support for humulus and limifrons being together. That's still there. And there's a certain amount of support for 
the other split which puts the Mifrons with the Neophobus. And I think we also had another split before, which was a bit broader. But we'll look at that comparison there. Humulus limifron versus Miniotopus uh, with limifron. Broadly, we would expect the phylogenetic network to not change much with a distant, different distance measure. If it does change a lot, then we might need to be really careful with the um, conclusions we draw from the phylogeny because it might not be reliable. Let's try another distance measure now before we move on. So another model that we spoke about was HKY85. So I'm just going to select that, use apply, and rotate around so I've got things more or less the same place. Be a good place to pause the video and see whether things have moved or not. And let's see if we can find our lineages of interest. We've got limifrons up here now. We'll zoom in to that clade a bit. Limifrons, Neotopus, and Humulus. And if I click on this split here, it does look a bit longer. I think it was in the previous uh, distance measures as well, than this split, which separates the other two. So still a reasonable story, and it might be interesting to know exactly what is the relationship between these uh, three taxa. Well, one way we can do that is, or investigate that, is by doing a bootstrap. So a bootstrap sample. I'm going to set this up and start running. It takes a little moment and we'll see a progress bar up here near the bottom of the screen while I talk this through. So bootstrapping is the resampling of the original data set with replacement uh, up to the size of the original data set. And each time you do that, you do the same analysis. And then you total up how often various features that you're interested in actually appear in each of those replicates. Um, and the things that we read something from are, of course, the sites in the alignment. Because it's with replacement, we might sample the same site multiple times in a given resampling um, instance, or we might not get it at all. But this gives us a really good way of understanding the sort of reliability or the robustness that our data set has in terms of the splits that it's supporting. So we'll just let that go a few more moments. There we go. So we've now got um, numbers on each branch, um, including the, the tips, uh, pendant edges of our network. Those are all going to be 100 because they have to appear, they appear in every network. That's not particularly interesting. Let's look at our favorite clade, if we can find it again. So here's Linifrons, Humulus, Lineotopus. And let's zoom in on that, that clade. Again, just to remind you, this is using the scroll on the mouse. So if I pan over there, I can see that in 99.9% .9 of my 1,000, so in all but one of my replicates, this split occurred that had limifrons and humulus together. If I can, I can get this other split. And in that one, the number there, hope you can make it out, 38.3. Notice another nice trick that you can do with split tree. You can just click on the number and drag it. And while you're doing that, it's maintaining a, a link to one of those parallel lines to tell you which split it corresponds to. So in the bootstrap replicates, only 38.3% of them had that split in them, which is very strong uh, support for this actually being the correct um, split and therefore a branch that we would expect to see in the correct phylogeny for this group of species. Um, we can also see that right in the middle here, we've got some splits that occur hardly ever. So a 4%, 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%, 11%, 12%, 13%, 14%, 15%, 16%, 17%, 18%, 19%, 20%, 21%, 22%, 23%, 24%, 
0.1% uh, presumably means that the other splits were equally frequent that could possibly separate these factor out. Very un uncommon. So this internal structure of the of this um, tree is going to be hard to work out because the bootstrap supports of the splits in the in the middle of this tree where the common ancestor must be are very very low. Some splits are more um, well supported than others, but even so, a bootstrap of less than about eighty is probably not great. Uh, there's a few more cute navigation tricks that we can do at this point, and I should point out, if you are trying to find out what's going on, I'm going to just drag that particular bootstrap out. I can select the end, if I can find it, yes, I can select the end of a split and move that to, so you can see where it goes. It's not super useful, but it's kind of fun. It does help when you're wanting to emphasize certain relationships. And that's about it. So I hope that is useful to understand what a split, um, what splits tree does and how a phylogenetic network can help you understand um, quite a lot more than a simple uh, initial tree and to help you understand where there might be issues in inferring the tree. Thank you very much.